Good afternoon, and a warm welcome to a very special episode of our talk show series, Let's Talk Primary Healthcare. I believe I speak on behalf of all of us primary healthcare enthusiasts when I say we are honored to be joined by exceptional leaders in the area of public health and primary healthcare transformation. With me in the studio is Dr. Hans Kluge, WHO Regional Director for Europe, Dr. Ajar Giniat, Minister of Health for Kazakhstan, and online I'm joined by Dr. Vesna Petric, Director General of the Public Health Directorate of the Ministry of Health of Slovenia, and by Dr. Peter Bergen, Founder of Rural Medicine Center in Sweden. We will be talking today about leadership. Leadership for the transformation of primary healthcare. What type of leadership matters for this transformation? How can we purposefully and intentionally build this leadership? And how can we connect leaders at national, regional, and local levels? We will begin with a one-hour panel discussion, and then we invite you to two breakout sessions to hear your views about your experiences and thoughts on leadership. In the meantime, please use our chat, say hello to us, share your comments, and our team will also be sharing useful resources with you. And this brings us to our first round where I would like to talk about how we move from vision to action. Primary healthcare is an area where our vision is so clear at global level, at regional level. It's expressed in global and regional commitments. At country level, we also see quite a lot of clarity on policy frameworks. And yet, we see a lot of implementation gaps when we look at progress on the ground. What can leaders do to move us from vision to action? And with that, I would like to turn to our WHO Regional Director, Dr. Kluge, dear Hans. You have a broad perspective of the 53 member states of a very diverse region. What would be your top three recommendations for primary healthcare transformers from a leadership perspective? Thank you very much, dear Marita, for having me on the show. You know, I'm a great supporter of this uh, talk show, which is very helpful. And thank you very much, Madam Minister, for joining us uh, as well. So to the point, I would say the first one is to have a very clear vision and the vision to take it as a momentum to rally everyone. So it's not just to have a vision, but the process is important, including people who are a little bit reluctant even. Mm. People from national level, regional level, local level, and of course, first and foremost, the primary healthcare worker. So a burning platform. So that's why, you know, my vision, Rita, it's united action for better health. Second, I would say, is a coalition of the willing. Because human beings by nature are a bit hardwired. Mm. So you need to start with people who are believers. Because there will be enough resistance. You need a coalition of the willing. And third one, I would use the concept of iceberg of ignorance. Mm. It means that the higher you get in the management chain, and I have experience, the further you get from the real issues on the ground. And that's why, and you know me, Marita, wherever I go, I want to go to a primary healthcare clinic. I want to speak to the nurses, to the social workers, to the patient myself. And frankly speaking, if you collect that information, it's a perfect recipe for real reform. Thank you very much, Hans. Let me come to Kazakh experience then, Madam Minister. Kazakhstan has a great experience transforming primary healthcare, and it has been a complex transformation moving towards multidisciplinary teams, but also aligning the financing, the human resource policies, the investment with this. What can other countries learn from your experience from a leadership perspective? Спасибо, госпожа Мелите. Хотела сначала поприветствовать всех участников ток-шоу, уважаемых спикеров, и поблагодарить вас за такой возможность мне участвовать в таком мероприятии. Да, Казахстан 
как вы знаете, является родиной ПМСП, и, и мы всегда хотели и думали, как лучше эффективно организовать ПМСП, первичную медико-санитарную помощь. И проводились много реформ, и в конце концов нашли мы эффективный, эффективный метод, эффективную организацию первичной медико-санитарной помощи, как с помощью и путем вот организации мультидисциплинарных бригад. Это врач и другие специалисты, в том числе медицинские работники, их медицинский средний медперсонал, их не один, их трое mm. у врача общей практики. Также и социальный работник в этой команде работает, и психологи. Mm. Они оказывают комплексную медико-социальную помощь. И мы же понимаем, что не, не, надо перейти от того, чтобы не, не, не только болезни лечить, но лечить ну, самого человека. У него есть проблемы и социальные, есть э, из-за социальных медицинских проблем и психологические проблемы. И вот это комплексное оказание медицинской помощи, он оказался более эффективным. Thank you very much. And indeed, from a leadership perspective, the team approach is something we will come back to throughout our discussion today. Uh, let me come to Slovenia. Slovenia is now immersed in the development of a new primary healthcare strategy. And Slovenia is not alone because quite a few countries in our region are revisiting their policy frameworks on primary healthcare based on lessons learned from the pandemic. Uh, You, Vesna, are leading this process with your Minister of Health to develop this new strategy. What have been some lessons learned from a leadership perspective for other countries who also want to go on this path? Thank you, Melita. I would first of all uh, su subscribe to everything that Hans has said, so I, there's no need to repeat. Uh, but uh, I start with saying that because I, I think not everybody knows Slovenia so well, I would just spend two sentences on my country. First, Slovenia is a very small country. We are two million uh, people. And second, we have very strong primary health care and public health. And we have a almost 100 year of tradition, primary health care and public health care, the public health working together. It's important to understand this. And now I'm going back to the lessons learned, as you ask. First, what is very clear to us here is that you can't fix it all with a single intervention, reform or a strategy. Primary health care is a very complex structure indeed, and also needs to adapt all the time to the needs of population. So it is about the process, it's not about one-time fix. And second, there is never one person in a driving seat in something as complex as primary health care. It's always networking between different professions, different parts of the system, like Ministry of Health, Public Health, Primary Health Care, secondary level, to find appropriate solution. Uh, I just uh, briefly go into what's going on in Slovenia. We have realized already as early as in 2000 that we need to introduce more preventive services in the system. And we have looked um, to Finland and to some other good um, examples that were brought up uh, in our cooperation with WHO and have started to develop something that were health educational centers in primary health care. But very soon we have realized that this is not actually addressing the needs of those most vulnerable. It was addressing the needs of those that were already attending services in primary health care. So another important lesson is that in the process you have always to evaluate and look if you actually are um, addressing appropriate needs of population, those that you intended to address. Then I would also say that Slovenia, uh, uh, becoming independent in 92, had a lot of contacts with the WHO and we were 
uh, hosting a big conference on health systems in 96. And that's why we were always very eager to attend all the conferences that were organized by WHO. And this was also very important for our process because we got a lot of international evidence that was backing our reforms and our reform in 2016 placed primary health care as a top priority, strengthening primary health care, top priority of Slovenian health care plan. Also, important lesson to be learned was that you have to carefully analyze part of the system that you want to reform. So we did a very thorough uh, reform also together with uh, WHO, uh, looking at primary health care to find out what could be improved there and why. And I think I'll stop here with the process and I'll just uh, continue when I said It's not only about one person in the leadership position. It's also um, uh, within the process, we have realized that we have to include all the professionals and all the people and their leaders in the process if we want to progress. Uh, And this goes for a local level as it goes for different parts of the system. And it also is important to include on one side public health and on the other side primary health care and the leaders there. So, as I said at the beginning, is a network of leaders that works uh, best. Indeed, and some of these speak to us very much. In fact, Hans, you also very often talk about uh, facing the brutal truths, isn't it, some of the phrases you use? but also inclusiveness and stakeholder support uh, are very important uh, characteristic uh, uh, of a good strategy development process. Dear Peter, I'm coming to you now. Uh, You're working as a a family doctor in a rural area of southern Sweden, uh, and you have done a lot of research how to tailor specific service delivery solution to the needs of your people, of the people you're serving. What are your views on leadership and to move from vision to action from a local perspective? Thanks a lot, Melit. Um, um, I will try to take it on a local level, uh, which is natural for me. Um, I've been working as a GP in a small town in a very sparsely populated area in northern Sweden for 30 years. And um, what I think in some extent distinguished work in remote areas from work in large cities is that you live very close to your patient. You live in their midst, for better or worse. I know them and they know me. One advantage of that is that you can easily understand what, what needs there are in the population. All you have to do is listen. Um, it's, but it's in a way also easy to generalize. I often meet people in leadership position who talks about the remoteness problem as if sparsely populated areas were the same everywhere. No one believed that London and Istanbul are the same thing, even though both places are big cities. In reality, <clears throat> all municipalities are different and you need local leaders grounded in the context they operate. If you want to create strong primary care systems, I think a success factor for us is that we have been digging where we stand. Another quality that you as a leader need is courage. In Sweden, it's much easier to get forgiveness than permission. So we have often started quite extensive projects and changes at our um, small uh, R&D center without asking permission. Uh, Usually it will be good and then everyone will be happy. Sometimes it goes wrong and then you can get forgiveness. To dare and show opportunities builds trust, I think. Trust that you can then give to others who in turn dare to try. And in the end, maybe, you have a self-playing piano where creativity flows. The last thing I want to mention, I think I have one more minute, uh, is that after you have the foundation in the local context solid, you need inspiration and knowledge uh, that others possess. We realize that if we wanted to get tips 
on how to develop care and sparsely populated areas. Our large cities in Sweden were not the right arena, but we looked out into the world, sought healthcare system that worked with care in remote areas, R&D departments that were actually interested in the special needs of sparsely populated areas. And then we politely asked them if they were interested in collaboration with us. And to our surprise, most of them were. So we have built a both national and international network where we now have more or less developed collaboration with healthcare systems or universities in more than 20 countries on five continents. And I hope after this meeting, we can expand our network with those of you listening who think you want to contribute and who are, who are also nice. We like to work with nice people and we are kind of nice ourselves. Thank you, Melita. <laughs> you are inspiring a lot of yes. thoughts uh, in my head. Uh, one of them is uh, something we discussed today that for uh, strong primary health care implementation, we need strong national policy frameworks, but we need to tailor implementation to regional and local context. But you're now asking the question, <coughs> to which level we need to tailor it down, because every community is different from each other. And I think this is a very interesting discussion we can take forward. Certainly your messages on listening is echoing uh, some of the previous messages. And don't we know something uh, about uh, doing and asking for permission later in large bureaucracies? So that speaks to all of us uh, very much. Uh, several of you mentioned the importance of learning from action, right? And the motto that I used to motivate our uh, first round is that we really need to move from vision to action. But if we want to see action, we have to learn from action. Let me come back to you, Hans. One of the goals of your visit here in Kazakhstan is to launch a WHO primary healthcare demonstration platform. Can you talk about this initiative and how this can support leadership development? Yes, uh, thank you, Mirita. Indeed, you, you know, I think we share the uh, same obsession to move from vision to action, ultimately to impact, because mm. we need to have impact. And what is better than to go, if someone wants to do something, to a place where people <coughs> have done it real life? You can see and discuss with the people what were the real life obstacles. And there are many nuances that you will never read in an article sometimes delicate but you need to know and what are the enablers to overcome those so that's the whole idea of the primary healthcare demonstration platform i'm tremendously honored and inspired to launch it tomorrow with dr Giniat, minister of health of kazakhstan particularly it's not in a big city it's in fact more <laughs> where i understand the uh, location that peter is working in the more rural area. So it will be a three to five days study visit combined with policy dialogue, with technical workshop, and really seeing how it works in reality, acknowledging that, as Vesna was telling, every context is different, but at least there's some generic obstacles and enablers to be discussed. And of course, we have the plan, right, Melita, to build upon those to have, because we have a very varied region, 53 member states, to have in different geopolitical blocks such a demonstration platform. But congratulations, Madam Minister, that Kazakhstan, again, since 1978, is uh, paving the way as a pioneer. And on that note, now I would like to invite you all to watch a short video with us which we recorded in Isik town, uh, where we will be launching the WHO primary healthcare demonstration platform tomorrow. And we recorded this with the director of the primary healthcare facility, asking her for leadership advice for other primary healthcare transformers. Well, thank you, first of all, for this honor, for the recognition of our organization, for our everyday work, work in the work of PMSP, первичной помощи, оказание помощи населению, помощи пациентам. Конечно, начало было заложено с чего? С того, что мы подход по помощи населению, по профилактике начали с того, что это подход к семье. Подход к семье, подход сразу с помощью социальных работников определяли социальную эко-карту, социальный статус, социальное положение семьи, которое 
находится, прикреплена к нам, и которой мы оказываем первичную помощь. Определив вот такой подход семейный, уже мы пошли по пути, конечно, изменения направления, в первую очередь, самого медицинского персонала. Врачи в прошлом, которые работали только отдельно со взрослыми пациентами, врачи, которые работали только с, с детьми, мы организовали самое важное, наверное, это переобучение, изменения и расширение их функций, расширение функций их как семейных врачей. Это первый этап переобучения, переобучение врачей, повышение квалификации, повышение квалификации, определение функций семейных медсестер, определение в этой же команде функций социальных работников и психологов. И вот первые шаги, это были шаги измениться нам самим, понять, как мы это будем работать и делать. Дальнейшие шаги – это разъяснение, обязательно объяснение этой, наверное, проблем, ну, этих изменений самому населению. Мы начинали с пациентов, начинали с сообществ, мы начинали, мы шли в местные акиматы, мы встречались с лидерами местных сообществ, мы приглашали сюда. Ну, есть всегда люди, которые очень активны и всегда посещают медицинские организации. Мы пошли шагами и встречу на встречу к ним. Мы начали их привлекать к пониманию, почему ПМСП должно так измениться и зачем мы меняем, на, меняем всю помощь на вид семейной практики. Мы работали расширенно и с, местными, с местными исполнительными органами, которые с, с школьными сообществами и работаем, с м, органами опеки, социальными службами, которые вот шаг за шагом, разъясняя, привлекая к нашей работе, они вот явились, наверное, нашими самыми главными, м, на, самой главной поддержкой для нас. This video is a very good segue into our second round, where I would like to talk about the shifts we are seeing in primary healthcare and what that implies for leadership. <laughs> primary healthcare of the future is increasingly complex. We are moving towards multidisciplinary teams, a networked approach, multimodal delivery combining face-to-face -face and digital services. This requires new leadership skills. Let's continue with Kazakhstan, uh, Madam Minister. Is every director of primary healthcare facility like Dr. Abueva, whom we heard on the video? And what are you doing in Kazakhstan to strengthen leadership skills? Because as we heard from Vesna, it's not one person, right? We need, we have a lot of leaders in primary healthcare and we need them at all levels. Очень хороший вопрос, Милита. Как моя коллега отметила, что само вообще политическая воля или воля Министерства здравоохранения внедрить более эффективную модель, медико-социальную модель или мультидисциплинарную модель, это одно. У нас было все, у нас политическая воля, поддержка правительства, это дополнительное выделение финансирования, чтобы набрать не медицинских работников mm. в то время, это социальные работники, это психологи, они должны, чтобы прийти в систему, обучить их, сертифицировать, научить их именно работать медицинскими психологами или социальных работников, которые были обучены в соцзащите, mm. переобучить, mm. чтобы они теперь могли в медицине работать с уклоном на медицинскую помощь. Это было очень сложно. И мы это достигали постепенно, годами. И сейчас, конечно, очень много прошло обучение, поняли сами медицинские работники, в чем эффективность и плюс этой мультидисциплинарной помощи. Научились социальные работники, они перестроили, перестроились именно работать в системе здравоохранения, также психологи, и к этому нужно было время. Это у нас не сразу получилось. Конечно, есть хорошие руководители, как Абеува Джамиля. Uh -huh. Я хотелось бы, чтобы они были везде. Uh -huh. Многое зависит от, конечно, лидерских качеств руководителя. 
Для этого мы дали возможность автономность каждой медицинской mm. организации. Мы дали им хорошее финансирование. Несмотря что страна большая, имеется 17 регионов, и они разные, и очень много только с районных таких поликлиник у нас более 200 финансирование одинаковое, так как консолидация бюджета на республиканском уровне, он дает возможность каждому жителю, где бы он ни жил, получить одинаковый комплексный подушевой норматив на, и финансирование каждой э, клинико-диагностических услуг на уровне ПМСП. И, э, конечно, у нас стандартизированное обучение всех наших лидеров. Но мы большие программы за последние 6-7 лет целенаправленно обучали лидеров. Целенаправленно шло обучение первых руководителей медицинских организаций, mm. где, где их нацеливали на определенные индикаторы, на достижение mm. определенных результатов, показателей своей работы. Конечно, это дало возможность и со стороны Министерства здравоохранения всегда самые лучшие поликлиники, самые лучшие менеджеры, они всегда поощрялись, чтобы, как вы говорили, чтобы другие могли тянуться к вершине, к своим mm -hmm. целям. We heard the word multidisciplinary so many times today in our discussion, but this is really difficult to do in practice, right? Uh, not just in primary healthcare, but we in WHO, we are trying to overcome our silos. And many private companies have found when they were able to overcome vertical programs and silos, their performance dramatically improved. Hans, you used to have a passion to study uh, uh, successful private companies that have achieved major transformation in their performance. Any lessons that you think might be relevant for primary healthcare? Well, you tell it yourself, uh, Melita, that uh, in WHO, it's a little bit the same, like in a health system, right, <laughs> yeah. to overcome. And interesting, recently I was in Malta, I uh, was uh, meeting there my old brother, Dr. Golden Galea, and we used to have, as two directors, this program where you were the uh, driver on health systems for NCDs, two big divisions to work together, and you're reflecting what is needed. And in fact, you need what we call a boundary spanner, which in that case, uh, you were uh, Mita, leading to the CIGES conference. A boundary spanner is someone who believes in the benefit, the vision of working across boundaries in a win-win situation. Right? This is, and for this, you need to have a lot of emotional intelligence because there will be ups and downs, but you need to inspire. And then you need to realize that the Big success does not come from one big innovation. That's what the private company literature learns. Sometimes people think there is one big innovation which mm. makes it happening. In fact, I like the concept of a flywheel. It's a very heavy wheel, and you mm. need to push, push, push until it gains speed, and then it goes faster and faster. So big change, in my experience, happens by incremental small steps. Mm. But you need two things. You need determination. You need to be convinced and to be willing to go through the wall. At the same time, mm -hmm. you need a lot of modesty because otherwise it will be very discouraging. Let me pick up one word from uh, what you have been saying, and that is the word of innovation. And Peter, we're going to come to you because your center is in a very unique position to test innovations and new experiences for your particular population in uh, rural areas. We are soon to publish a vignette about your experience and Sweden's experience to use digital solutions to bridge access gaps. And let me quote one phrase from uh, this vignette. The center, your center, currently serves as an innovation milieu and a test bed for new digital tools and solutions. Tell us a little bit more about innovation and how what you think is important in the local perspective for its adaptation to your population. Well, <clears throat> thank you, Melita. I'll try. 
I think our eager to innovate is very much based on the fact that we are always quite few. It's always very far to everything. And we have a very aged population where more than 25% is older than 65 years and 10% is older than 80. And in Sweden, it's not in so many places that you have the same challenges, which is why we quickly realized that what we need, we must develop ourselves. We therefore started the Central Rural Medicine Wits about 15 years ago in Storeman, a small community just south of the Arctic Circle in the middle of the Swedish wilderness. And if we take the demographic, for instance, uh, we, uh, we realized that we have a very aged population, but many countries are heading in the same direction in, in Europe. And uh, it is expected to put great pressure on the healthcare system as old age in itself is one of the most important factors for morbidity. And we felt that in a way we were in the forefront of the demographic transformation in at least Western Europe. And it can never be wrong to be first. So if we could build good systems and technology for the care of the elderly in a sparsely populated context, it should be interesting for others, we presumed. In addition, if a technical or organizational innovation works in a sparsely populated context, it can most likely be scaled up to urban areas, which is very important, while the opposite re very rarely works. And when we have told our politicians about this insight, they can use our remote area as a kind of testing innovation ground. They believed in us and supported us financially so we, we can grow. Another great advantage for us is that um, our population has great confidence in our um, healthcare system. When we want to know what the population think is most important or we want to try an innovation, we just call for meetings and politely ask. And I, I can take an example on that. Uh, we had an idea that it would be interesting to see how much of their own health an elderly population could take care of themselves if we offer them best available technical support. And we identified, uh, find um, an area far from the nearest healthcare center and called the population to a meeting. 70% of the total population came. The oldest one was 101 years. Mm. And they said, this is a great idea. We want to participate. And this is how we started our or what you can call it, our innovation, the virtual community room. Um, the rooms as such are analog, but the service in rooms are mainly digital. Here, together with the population, we test various technical solutions that companies offer. And it has gone so well, I would say, that our politicians have expanded to eight virtual community rooms in our region. And we have also, in different projects, helped to start community rooms in Denmark, Indonesia, and India. And none of this would be possible without kind of close collaboration with medtech industry. And we have in all years built good relationships, I think, with companies in various national and international projects. And in the recent years, we have also tried to, to find a well-functioning way to organize this cooperation, collaboration model between companies and regions that provides win-win. And um, this is not finished, but it's, I think it's promising. Thank you, Melita. So I am hearing very interesting concepts about innovation and, and scaling up uh, innovations from the bottom up. Uh, this is making me think at all the examples you're sharing. These are examples of distributive leadership and collective decision making. And uh, I think how powerful this is for primary healthcare, where we do need this local tailoring to the local context. We do need this distributive leadership. Vesna, let me come to you on this, right? Uh, because there is this very strong theme coming through of connecting national, regional and local leadership mechanisms Certainly, these innovations need to be scaled up, and at some point, the local leadership and requires some regional and national support. Slovenia has a very strong tradition of combining national and local efforts in leadership. Can you please share some experiences with us on this? Thank you very much, Milita. Uh, indeed, we do, do have a lot of experience uh, in working together, uh, primary healthcare and public health. 
locally, of course, also. But um, uh, uh, as I said before, um, the most important thing is that you understand the needs of population. I said that we have uh, made an analysis uh, of primary health care to actually know better what could be improved in primary health care. But then you need a, a consensus um, uh, where everybody agrees on what is needed there. And when building the consensus, you often forget that the consensus should be based on the needs of population, because there is not only professional consensus, the consensus need to be broader, political consensus is needed to change things appropriately, because any reform needs to be supported by some investments, and this is important to understand. So you always have to go from the needs of population and how you are going with the change to address those needs of population. And this sometimes is missing because we are all discussing how could we improve our ways of working, about the conditions and so on. But what should lead us always is actually the needs of population. And um, maybe um, I would go to the innovative approaches. They most of the time arise from the needs of population. You know, people that are working with uh, with um, patients and with the population at the local level, they have to think of innovation because they are there and they can realize that something is not actually addressing those needs appropriately. So they are very innovative, and you should try to uh, try to um, um, generate this innovative. Um, ideas, you know, when you are planning, even at the national level. So these, these things, I think uh, we have done quite well because we were focusing on the local level and we were in all our programs in the last uh, 10 years, we were working with the primary healthcare centers and not just making a kind of reform, you know, at the highest level involving uh, the usual ones, the payer and, you know, professionals and so on. We were actually through the projects that were very much uh, financed through EU uh, financial resources. We were trying to build capacities at the local level, but also listening for the solutions there. Uh, so uh, that is one thing that I wanted uh, to, to, to say. The other thing is that also through our experience during COVID, we have realized how important it is the primary healthcare center um, in the community uh, to even uh, promote public health measures such as, uh, such as vaccination, for example. Mm. Uh, and that there you always have to think of primary healthcare center reaching out, uh, not just being there for people to come to, but reaching out, working together with NGOs also uh, to promote, for example, such a measure as vaccination. Uh, and also to engaging local administration like mayors that can promote kind of uh, a kind of intervention and work together with the primary health care center and the, the relevant NGOs that are there to, uh, to actually um, uh, make um, uh, a, a good understanding of the local community why, for example, vaccination is appropriate uh, solution. May I stay with you for a comeback, uh, dear Vesna? When I was in Slovenia in the autumn, I was impressed by many things, but particularly by one solution that connects national and local governance. And that is the municipal health profiles, which are produced by the National Public Health Institute based on a uniform approach. But then these municipal health profiles are shared with the municipalities who can then establish and prioritize action on it. Could you tell us a little bit more about them? Well, the idea was exactly what I was just saying, you know, that we have to engage local communities and their uh, administrations to understand better why they should invest in, in health uh, care and in, even in prevention and uh, ser preventive services. And even in the NGOs that are there to actually 
bring into the services those most vulnerable uh, and most in need um, uh, uh, and uh, health profiles. Um, this is an instrument that, you know, can, can show the local administration uh, the, uh, what is their problem, uh, what is the problem of their population and what should be uh, the priorities that they would go for. Uh, and um, it is the, it, these are the data uh, that tell um, local community administration uh, if there is a need of more services supporting those that are drinking in a harmful way, perhaps obesity is a problem or there is uh, perhaps uh, a need for more services to get to a specific groups of population that don't attend services this kind of thing. So uh, uh, this kind of uh, tool, uh, I think it's very appropriate for the local administration to be able to judge better where the priorities are. Yeah, indeed. And information can become a catalyst for action. And without the actions of your public health institute, the municipalities might not have this information about health issues and health priorities. If I put together all you have said in this past round, very strong conclusions emerge. What we need to take into account where we design governance mechanisms for primary healthcare, when we design leadership programs for primary healthcare. We need to purposefully invest, right? As we heard from the example of Kazakhstan into leadership and training for leadership. Second, this needs to be multidisciplinary. And we need to facilitate this boundary spanning, right? That we all are challenged to come out of our silos and our particular ways of having been trained and consider a broader perspective. If we want to have multidisciplinary primary healthcare, we need to have multidisciplinary governance mechanisms and multidisciplinary leadership approaches. Then there is the local and national dimension. Hierarchical top-down approaches are unlikely to work if we want to tailor to local context, and if we want to encourage local innovation. So we need to create governance mechanisms where we can channel the voice of practice, where we can channel local innovation to policy, but then we can channel strong policy frameworks and their implementation to uh, localities. I think this is very, very strong, and it's a tall order for us to try to implement it um, at country level uh, in the future. Hans, let's close this round with you. Uh, you already mentioned one important way in which WHO can support leaders, the way we will be launching the WHO primary healthcare demonstration platform. What are some other ways in, the, in which WHO support leadership development? I think it's important, Rita, to walk the talk. Mm -hmm. We have to walk the talk. And whatever we do in these challenging times, you know, we have to stand strong on our values. You know that I believe in that one. So this is what we do. Keep solidarity and equity in mind. And the best way, as the colleagues were telling, to do this is listen to the people. Always keep in touch with the people indeed. They will tell us whether we're on track or not. And part of it, and I know that's something very close to the heart also of Vesna, is civil society, mm. NGOs, non-governmental organizations, because they have <clears throat> the boots on the ground, and they will be very happy to tell mm. whether something is theoretical or something is really working. Mm. So I'd say that is one point. The second one, and from personal experience, is keep reading. Mm. Be feverish, right? Always realize what you don't know. Mm. And read something more. The more experience you get, the more you will read something that you know already. But my father used to say, if you go to a conference or you read something and there is 7% from that new, it's successful. Mm. Pick up that 7% and it's a, a cycle of lifelong learning. I think that's probably what I would like to, uh, uh, to add, uh, Marita, yes. That's very good. And uh, maybe a specific WHO initiative I'd like to uh, highlight that you launched personally is the Pan-European Leadership yes. Academy. Uh, yes. Would you like to say a few words Absolutely. about that? Absolutely. Absolutely. That was a campaign commitment that particularly for the countries of Central Asia and uh, the Western Balkan, right, to create a cadre of 
<clears throat> future public health leaders. And in fact, we start, despite of the pandemic, I'm very proud of this, our team started the first pilot project with eight young perspective leaders to take them for one year, give them formal training through WHO, and then second them either to a country office or to a GDO. And, and thank you for also accepting in the GDO in primary health care. Then the people go back to their country. They will better understand how WHO is working. We better understand how a country's administration is working. And it opens also the door to become future WHO leaders. Indeed. And I believe my colleagues are now pasting the link to the chat of, uh, for more information about the Pan-European Leadership Academy Great. and how anybody uh, can apply. With that, we have come to our final round. Uh, but I would like to hit here a little bit more personal note, if you allow me. Uh, you have been recognized by many as leaders, great leaders, and we are very curious about your own journey. What have been the three most important lessons that have helped you grow as a leader? And who were or are your role models and how do they inspire you? Minister Guignat, let's start with you. <laughs> Для меня сегодня три урока, и сегодня очень часто на эти вопросы отвечал и доктор Ханс Клюге. Первое – это упорство и самосовершенствование, и саморазвитие. Mm. Это вот постоянная работа над собой, знать хотелки, вот, знать больше и знать все. Сегодня мы, выступая вместе с доктором Ханс Клюге перед студентами, говорили, что мы все, и доктор Ханс Клюге, и я, начинали мы с ПМСП, участковыми врачами. Mm. И работая участковым врачом, я видела, что мои пациенты, это 90-е годы, уезжали тяжелыми в инфекционные стационары. Тогда мне захотелось стать врачом-инфекционистом и лечить от тяжелых больных в интенсивных палатах. И вот так каждый раз ставила себе цель и шла к этому. Второй урок это, – это быть энтузиастом, mm. это быть человеком, преданным своему делу. Это надо постоянно воодушевлять, увлекать себя и других во благо своего дела, своего, своей профессии. Это тоже очень помогает быть хорошим лидером. Третий мой урок – это постоянно делиться своим опытом, делиться опытом своими единомышленниками, коллегами, обучать их и вместе идти, тоже достигать своей цели. Very important lessons, and I think many of us believe in these very much. Vesna, let's come to you. Well, I was very privileged uh, that I worked as a contact point in Slovenia for WHO since 1980. Uh, 89, 98, yes, sorry. Uh, so it's a long time of a very productive cooperation uh, with WHO. And uh, I met so many people there that I could list as role models. And uh, one is sitting there in our podium. It's Hans, definitely. But there are so many others that worked for WHO. And I met them in the past. And I could share with them um, my idea and uh, they were actually um, adding to my uh, enthusiasm to, uh, to do my best uh, in uh, um, supporting our decision makers here in Slovenia with the evidence and good practices that, you know, are generated internationally uh, when they have to make a certain decision. But on the other side, also, Slovenia has... A, um, a lot of very enthusiastic people in health sector. And they are very well linked to international uh, entities, for example, Wonka and WHO, and you know, they, they work internationally a lot. And this is because we are a very small country 
and there is lack of critical mass of people working in one area. Uh, and if you want to discuss whatever uh, idea you've got, you know, you have to go abroad and you have to, to you know, try to find uh, networks, uh, uh, different networks and uh, work uh, with those people there uh, to see if your idea, you know, is appropriate or to challenge your own idea. So um, I think uh, for me, I could find so many role models internationally and nationally. And I, as I said at the beginning, when it comes to the leadership, I think it's especially in this area of health is more networks than one person that can do it. Peter, let's come to you and let's hear about your journey. Oh, thank you, Melita. <clears throat> I think my first insight um, uh, has been that you can actually turn what many people think is a problem into an exciting challenge. Our uh, demographic are such example. Instead of feeling sorry for ourselves because we have an old and sickly population, we can choose to see it as a success factor, something that could give us advantages in competition with others. And also the fact that... We, I or we live in a sparsely populated area is, is kind of an example. In Sweden, sparsely populated areas are being regarded as underdeveloped areas. The city is the norm. And um, driving innovation and technology development from a remote context surprise and gives us much more publicity publicity and attention than corresponding work from large cities. And we take advantage of this fact without being ashamed. Uh, my second insight is that the importance of trust. I've talked a little bit of it before. Trust is not something you get, but something you deserve. And it takes some time to build it. Uh, I have tried to build my leadership a lot on daring to believe that others can do more than I can do. And the trust applies both to the population, partners, and, and the working group. And it builds what you called distributed leadership, which is very, very, uh, very, very uh, needed. My third insight is the importance of local context. If you want to design a primary care system for sparsely populated areas, you have to do it in sparsely populated areas. It's not possible to transfer city systems or to us, and they are usually built on expertise functions that we do not have. And the same goes for research. We meet a lot of people from large university cities who find it exciting and exotic to conduct research in our area, which is not bad, but it's even better if we can educate, grow, evaluate, and research in our own context and do it with people from our area too. Uh, the fact that we have succeeded in building the Central Rural Medicine in Sweden has given us some kind of status, both nationally and internationally. And suddenly, national decision makers and the government want us, us as an advisory board when Sweden, for example, is to design a new primary care system. We have also been commissioned by the Nordic Council of Ministers to evaluate the use of welfare technology throughout the Nordic region. And today... A gray-haired rural doctor is speaking at the WHO conference. Mm -hmm. uh, this is not normal uh, when you are working in a small uh, rural primary care system. And um, finally, as a leader, I have probably mainly been inspired by colleagues. One that has inspired me a lot is uh, my predecessor in Sturman Healthcare Center, Dr. Janestam. He worked as a doctor in Sturman for 50 years and left at 86. I had him as a school doctor when I went to school myself. I took my own children to him at the child care center when they needed vaccination, and he was with me when my mother died. Uh, he inspired me to the medical profession and recruited me when I finished my studies. I was there to bury him when he died. And I think this history reflects the essence of primary care, continuity and good relations. Thank you, Melita. Yeah, there was a lot in there, uh, Peter, and thank you for really opening up and sharing all that. I will just pick out one moment. You said, we would like to make it normal that in these policy discussions, there is always the voice of practice. And it's our ethos, so to say, in our work now to connect and include the voice of practice. In all our talk show episodes, and this is the eighth of them, 
we always had a practitioner to channel the voice, that voice. And we think this is really, really important and a new area for WHO as well to make this connection happen for much more robust approaches and policies. Hans, let me come for you for the final uh, remarks on this. Thank you. Thank you, Mita. It's, uh, I'm, congratulations. I mean, I'm tremendously inspired. Minister Vesna, Peter, I mean, I, uh, there is so much uh, really in here. My head is spinning. Mm. And uh, maybe to add from personal experience, that mentorship for me has mm. been always very important. And mentors doesn't mean a boss necessarily. A mentor mm. can be everywhere, but you have to be open for it. Because there also will be moments, and I think all of us know this, that you will be hit to the ground. Mm. Because you're not always at the top, right? And especially if you want to change. Mm. Some people are looking for a weak moment. And then to have a mentor is very important to give you, again, the confidence. Because what I learned... In fact, there was a moment in my career, I thought I was Superman. But I got <laughs> over this wisdom that there is no Superman or Superwoman. That everyone now has its strengths and weaknesses. And mentors who believe in you, but at the same time are mm. brutally honest with mm. you, are very, very uh, important in the professional side, but also in the personal side. And there I'm very blessed. And uh, you know probably what I'm going to tell Milita, that at home I have the... Uh, three uh, <laughs> ladies who are always very, very happy to tell me, <laughs> brutally honest, what, what's going fine and not. And it's very important to keep you with the feet on the ground. Because as yeah. a leader, it is so easy to be surrounded by people who applaud you and telling you doing a great job and everything is perfect. Well, it is not, because that's the start of the end. And therefore, I think mentorship is something that has served always me very well. Thank you for, for sharing that uh, indeed. And I think many of us can identify with that very important role of uh, mentorship. Today we had a very rich discussion. Uh, it was richer than I would be able to attempt to summarize it. We have made some very important conclusions from our discussion on leadership for governance uh, of primary health care and our ability to uh, cr uh, support leadership uh, and purposefully cultivate leadership. At a personal note, let me just pick out four key words. You have inspired me very much uh, throughout this past hour, but I, let me just highlight four key words that I think is more important than ever. The first one is listening, right? We are so good at talking, myself included. We are trained to talk. We are not trained to listen. And that is really critical, whether we're talking about listening to the people right, in service delivery design, whether we are li uh, listening to our practitioners in the way we design policies, it's very, very important uh, to listen, and we have to all become much better at it. The second one, Madam Minister, you mentioned hard work. Uh, this is undoubtedly so. Uh, some activities look so easy, so nice, so elegant, but we know that behind every successful sportsman, every successful politician, there is every successful talk show, there is a huge team and a huge effort to make that one uh, small moment of performance a success. The third one, Peter, I think you mentioned being daring, right? Overcoming our limitations. And sometimes you just have to dare to do things differently and think outside the box. And finally, I will pick out the word trust. Without trust, teamwork is not possible. Leadership is not possible, especially if you want to move towards distributed leadership. These are very, very important areas. I thank you all for taking the time in your very busy schedule to think and reflect with us about leadership. We will try to capture them in some more systematic way because I think this is really, really rewarding. And now it is your turn, listeners, dear listeners. We know you are many of us today with us. It delights us that you have joined us. We invite you to two breakout rooms. One breakout room will be in English language. The other one will be in Russian language, moderated by my colleagues. We would like to hear from you. We would like to hear your experiences about leadership and what you think matters for the transformation of primary health care. Until next time, I say goodbye to us and see you over in the breakout rooms.